Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Inquisitive Brain Podcast. I'm Shaw, your host. This is a show that brings you interviews and insights from all walks of life on the reality of being. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today, and I hope that you're all doing very well. On this episode, we discuss the very intriguing topic of coincidences and miracles. Sophia Dimas joins us, and Sophia is a mental health therapist. She's had quite a long, interesting career. She was first in fashion, similar to myself. Then she got a master's degree in counseling psychology, and then she moved into her career as a mental health therapist, but she's also an author. Sophia's written the book, The Divine Language of Coincidence, How Miracles Transformed My Life After I Began Paying Attention. And she's going to talk to us about how you can also learn to begin to pay attention, learn to look out for the signs of when things just appear in in your life sometimes they may appear to be uh, discouraging it could be troublesome challenging but actually sometimes these incidences or or um, shall we say can be coincidences but also can turn into miracles and Sophia gives us some really good examples of how that happens the scientific community has begun to take note of Sophia's work as well. And she does give some talk. She's involved in lots of different talks with different organizations to help explore the concept of miracles, the concept of coincidence. And we've all had experiences of labeling an incident or an occurrence as a coincidence, you know, thinking about something at the same time, Um, coming into contact with someone when they were thinking of you or wanting to meet someone and all of a sudden they appear in your life. Uh, Certainly, I mean, I can give loads of examples of those things happening. So you could say to yourself, is this a coincidence? And I know that we all use the term. Is it divine intervention? Is it a miracle that these things have happened? And miracles are very interesting to me because of the things that have happened certainly in my life. Some of Sophia's great work involves, at the moment, being an in-house counselor in a residential facility for ex-trafficked women at the Salvation Army, which is just spectacular. Sophia shows us that these extraordinary events can happen to anyone, an ordinary person, Sometimes we see people who are revered in a particular skill, but that doesn't mean coincidences or extraordinary events can't happen to them and everyone else. These extraordinary events can happen to anyone. So the key is to potentially receive miracles if your eyes are open to them. Uh, Be open to experiencing coincidences. And a lot of people say, oh, that was just, you know, a coincidence or the other phrase is that was just luck and you know I suppose depending on your belief system and depending on how you see the world you could use these phrases now sometimes they are I believe my belief system is they are miracles these things do happen where you know that the chance and there are chances but the percentage of chance of things happening is extraordinary and I've, I've got my own stories about that happening I, I think I still to this day some things have happened in my life and I still cannot understand how that extraordinary event happened uh, they were good things some of them were neutral things you know things that you think oh okay yes that changed that that made a difference to my life at that time um I can't think of anything bad happening, really. And I suppose one example would be being in the right place at the right time or being in the wrong place at the wrong time. That can happen for people. But so I suppose there's both sides, you know, 
what makes a miracle a miracle? What is the cause and effect of synchronicities? How, do, how does that happen? I believe it's scientific. I believe we're, we draw certain experiences towards us. The energy, people like to simplify it and call it manifestation or the secret, you know, just thinking of things and then the thing appearing. Um, I believe that happens as well. However, I do believe the unconscious mind, you know, I'm a trained hypnotherapist, so I, uh, you know, again, all sides, looking at the unconscious mind, things that we're not conscious about. So when people say, yes, but that bad thing happened to me, if we really delved into the, to the unconscious, we may find that actually we drew that in. Sometimes you're not aware of your thoughts. And I remember someone saying to me once, um, regard it was just a conversation we were all having a group of us about uh how things come into the fall how things come into your life or situations are presented to you and my take on that is well what were we meant to learn about that situation or about that person or about your choices how does that benefit your learning your growing your transmutation how does that benefit your soul? I, if I had to put a percentage on it, I would say something like 80 something percent of the time we're unaware of what we're thinking. And so the issue of what you're thinking happening, and I give an example. Once um, I was at somebody's house and they were uh, doing the, their unpacking, they'd been shopping and they were taking everything out the bags and they took out a carton of eggs and they said, I always end up breaking an egg. I, I always end up breaking an egg. And I said, it, well, it's going to happen. And of course it happened because they, that's what they told themselves because it kept happening. But they didn't realize the self-fulfilling prophecy. Sometimes it's that simple. I believe it's that simple. Or you could read something by chance. You could be watching something on telly. You could listen to a podcast. Somebody somehow, you could see a billboard that happens for people. There is power in advertising. My One of my oldest friends, Natalie Ford, and I did a podcast. Go back and see it. I'll link it below. And uh, she was talking about when we were very, very young, one of our, fir our first job, really, were, was at an advertising agency and it was just very powerful it was like really big at the time and the creativity there however what we because we were much younger than everybody else was obviously older but what we noticed as young young girls young women you know in their first jobs and that starting out was that people would think about these things sometimes they come in the next day and go straight to a storyboard and it would just flow, flow you know flood it was a flood of ideas but oftentimes there would be focus groups and people would brainstorm but if your focus is we have this account we need this we want this then everybody's on that page and how does that happen you bring it towards you you get the client and I've always believed, even back then, when I was just learning about yoga and just starting to learn about um, meditate, well, I knew meditation, but I was learning a bit more about how quickly things can manifest. Let's say someone had a negative experience with a particular brand, and that was the brand you were going to be pitching to, or you were going to be creating an ad for. If one person on that team had a negative thought it is unlikely that you will be getting that account and they, they people are unaware they're unaware they're unaware of it because they're not sometimes they will say maybe in a meeting oh you know i had um that brand or that particular sauce or whatever and oof, i didn't like it now you're the account executive you've got to come up you've got to lead a team to come up with a with a, a campaign for this brand. Um, and so uh, you either two, do two things, you can't, you're conscious, you become very consciously aware of this negative experience and this negative thought. 
And then you take action. You either work towards maybe trying the product again to change your, your view on it, or you uh, come off the campaign. <laughs> Something has to happen because if that negative energy is there now, would the person choose to say it to their colleagues? Well, you know, I don't want, because we're talking about big, we're talking about huge, big, big brands here. So national, international brands here, you know, that's a lot to risk. But I believe that a lot of people sometimes did not disclose their innermost thoughts about, about it. And if one person had a negative thought about the brand, it is unlikely that you will get the account. The energy of a group alone, group groups are powerful, extremely powerful. And it, although individuals can be as powerful, I believe, these are my beliefs based on my experiences. And a lot of people say, well, there's more power in numbers. My belief is not always. Not always. And that is because of the unconscious mind. So it's like the negative. It's the something Xing something out. So you may have 10 people. You think, yes, we're all on the same page. And you may have two people out of the 10. You may have those two people who believe, oh, this isn't, you know, I'm not, I'm not with this. I don't like that company or I don't like that brand or, you know, I hate those commercials that I'm seeing could be something but it's unconscious and they may never disclose it and they may appear on, on you know to the naked eye to be like yes we're for it let's go let's go let's go come on and they're working for it however it will show up in a way now why am I talking about this because uh, we're talking about coincidences but we're talking about synchronicities as well being in sync being on the same page and that is energetic that's something that's energetic and thoughts have energy. It becomes very hard to navigate life when you're unaware. So that's what all of this experience is about, is being aware. And Sophia is going to talk to us today about that. I went off on a little bit of a tangent, but I hope that you're, I hope that you all can tell us about your miracles, the things that you've experienced as well. And because you know, although we we can listen to other people talk about, and Sophia's written a book about some of her coincidences and miracles, how they transformed her life, which we'll talk about, but we'd like to hear from you as well. What are your miracles? How have miracles come into your life? What have they produced? Um, how's it all happened? What are your thoughts behind them happening? So we're going to get into the interview in a second. But before we do, I want to remind you all that if you have subscribed to the channel, turn on your notifications so you don't miss an episode. And if you're new here, please subscribe. We'd love to have you. And leave a comment. We need to know what you're thinking, what you'd like to hear about more. I've got some really interesting um, interviews coming up. So stay tuned. And without further ado, let's get into the interview. Let's welcome Sophia Dimas to the show. Sophia, lovely to see you. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. So I want to talk about your book, well, both books, but let's touch upon what I, I know the, our audience will be, you know, chomping at the bit to get to, and that is the issue of miracles. And what perhaps sometimes you call um, synchronicity, but I'm interested in, can you remember when you had your first concept of what a miracle might be? For a lot of us, it may have been a religious thing. I mean, I grew up Catholic, so there's lots of talk about miracles. And But for you, when did you first learn about miracles? Well, I mean, I, I had, my mother was very religious. And so she would talk about miracles as if they were everyday events, which proved to be correct, you know. Um, but, uh, but then it kind of went away, you know, and uh, I was 19. And I was go. I had two issues, I was going through this existential angst that I'm sure 
every 19 year old goes through. But there were two issues that were, in, I thought were unsolvable. And, and I was just, I mean, it, it had overtaken my life, my life, you know, my studies, I just, <clears throat> I was trying to figure out how to solve these two issues. And, and within a very short period of time, this man appeared in my life and a dream. And the dream was absolute, I mean, I can visualize it as if it was happening right now. And, um, and so what, um, basically, I mean, I'm just going to, basically what the dream was, I was, um, <clears throat> I was wearing a bride's dress, a bridal dress on a stage with no, with no groom. Okay, and, and I, I couldn't believe all these people who were there to see me. And and then fast forward to the end of the dream. I look down, I and, and these people are, are filing past me. And so I thought it was like the reception line, you know. And I look down, I'm still wearing the wedding dress, but I'm in a coffin. And it freaked me out. And in the middle of the night, I went to this man's house who I trusted with everything. And what he told me uh, was life-changing. And what he said to me, because I thought, you know, this portended my death, you know, like I was gonna get hit by a truck or something. And what he said, no, he said, this has nothing to do with physical death. He said, there's a part of you that you don't need any more. And that is what has died, making room for the new. And everything fell into place. And I literally was transformed. I, I, I was transformed into another person. I entered womanhood. I, and, and that was not lost on me. So I thought, okay, how can this happen? So then I started to pay attention. And so more things happened. And then I learned how to say thank you. And the more I said thank you, the more things happened. And, and my friends would say, oh, you know, these things only happen to you, which was a little annoying because I'm not special. I'm not a saint or a guru. And uh, then, oh, and 16 years ago, um, it, again, coincidence coincidence coincidentally i was facing a medium and she told me that i was going to write a book and i argued with her i said oh i said i'm sorry but that's not in the cards um you know i have nothing to write about and uh, also i'm a people person there's no way i'm going to sequester myself and write a book and uh in 2011 i was reconnecting with a childhood friend told her my latest miracle she says, oh, Sophia, these things only happen to you. And something clicked. And I went, you know, everyone has a coincidence story, a miracle story. But, it, you know, th these have guided my life. I mean, they're so numerous that, and then what, what I, when I discovered the key that, so what I believe is that this divine intelligence, there's this divine intelligence, God, whatever you want to call this thing that you can have a personal relationship with, this divine intelligence knows better what's good for us than we do and communicates with us in very, very clever ways. And um, so through dreams, uh, meeting a person and having that person tell you exactly what you need to know to solve your problem. And in my case, puts coincidences in my path to nudge me. So the key to taking a coincidence and turning it into a miracle is taking action on it. If I just said, oh, wow, this is so, wow, such a coincidence, and then just let it go. But that was the key. And once I discovered the key, I wanted to share it. So. That is kind of my background. And that's what led you to write the book, 
share? That's exactly, yes, yes. And and it's interesting, again, going back to this divine intelligence. Um, you know, I, I don't um, condone this thing of manifesting, you know, like you, you want something and you manifest it, you know? Yes, you could do that. But like, what if it's not good for you? Like, what if I want a red Ferrari? And instead of nice coincidences in my path, I get obstacles, obstacle, obstacle, uh, obstacle, you know, but God unfortunately gave us free will. So I'm getting that red Ferrari no matter what. So I go get the Ferrari and then I, I crash and die. Maybe I should have listened to the obstacles. So, um, so because I didn't want to get married that I had made a decision, my free will, my free will, no marriage, no children. I had my careers, you know, to focus on. And I was successful at being single until I was 45. And then I, again, in 2011, one of my mentors, Father Stephen, who um, he opens up the, uh, they're called Covenant House, and they are shelters for homeless teens, and introduced me to this beautiful young teenager from Turkey. And uh, we fell in love, and my husband and I adopted her, and now I became a mother and it, it's just like you know what if I was like mulish and just you know went on my on my decision I can't be happier so so that's what I want the message to be you know to you know be open listen take action yes that's beautiful and even as you were speaking earlier you were recounting that it that's it, uh, incident i felt i could feel the energy of it because you were going back there and it felt as though you were so open um and i don't know if you were aware of how open you were um but yes it, it felt like an open soul ready to yes. listen, ready to receive and um uh there i don't view you know one miracle as being bigger or better than another miracle. Actually, I don't know if you're familiar with A, a Course in Miracles. Yes, 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 I have the book, Marion Williams, yes. And uh, so so that uh, uh, that book, I resisted reading. I mean, it was slapping me in the face. And I mean, and I think I was, again, closed to the fact that it was channeled. Mm -hmm. It was channeled. and. I'm like, you know, I I hadn't like gotten that concept down yet. And and yet that I was forced to read it, literally. The, the stories in the book, the way I tripped on it. And it, it, it took like, oh, I think I would say two and a half years having this book slapped in my face, you know. But um, that that book defines a miracle as simply a change of perception for the better okay so so and and i see it like 40 years ago i was for capital punishment you know kill him get him off the street kill him you know now i mean even if a loved one was murdered um i i i could never say we're going to kill this person at this time. If we're gonna, you know, I I just can't take I I can't. So something happened there, you know. A change, yes. We do. Or oh, do you find that as you become much more aware and open to receiving uh, these miracles, that we become somehow more sensitive to the plight of the underprivileged you know uh, oh i'm sure a person will not see a murder as underprivileged but they're in a position now where they are sequestered they're in prison and so they've got no rights their free will's been taken away for, for good reason but do we become more sensitive to you know when people become vegan because they can't bear the the plight of everything. So do you think that happens? 
I see it in my own life. You know, I see it. I, I think that there are people who will never change. You know, their mindset is just such. They will never change. Uh, but I see what happened to me. And, and that book is not meant <clears throat> to change somebody's mind. It's this is what's worked for me, you know, simply put. And so I see that uh, even uh, my first career, which was architecture, you know, uh, when I was in architecture school, all I wanted to do was design the beautiful building. That's, that's what I wanted to do is just design beautiful spaces. And um, through a series of coincidences, um, and I write about this in the book as well, um, my, my idol in architecture school, or before actually, um, was Buckminster Fuller, who designed the geodesic dome. And a series of incredible coincidences occurred so that not only did I meet my idol, I had a, um, a correspondence with him and he asked me to work with him upon graduation. So how does that work? And then, and, and uh, you know, Buck, Bucky was a, a futurist and he was, he was one of the most spiritual people I've ever met. And that is not what he's known for, but all he cared about was his fellow man, humanity. And his creations, his architecture um, was to provide shelter for everyone and, and, and to uh, cover the most with the least. And, and that changed me. You know, so so you know, you come in contact with people. You read books. You 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 are aware, and the awareness is is I think one of the key ingredients, and taking action. Yes, you said that before, and taking yes. action. So, speaking of your book, um, viewers, listeners, it's the divine language of coincidence. This is what we're talking about now. How miracles transformed my life after I began paying attention. So how can people learn to pay attention to the things that are dropping right into their lives? You know, I've, I've thought of this uh, because these things have come so naturally to me. Um, but, you know, someone asked me why, I, why so many miracles have occurred in my life like you know or or why did i pick up on these little things and again i'm going back to my mother because what she did she was extremely religious you know she never forced me into anything but from being a toddler she would present greek was my first language <clears throat> so in greek you know she there's you can do the diminutive. So when she would talk about Jesus, it was the little Jesus and the little Virgin Mary. So if you um, want something, you whatever you want, you ask little Jesus. And if you want protection or you're scared, you ask the little Virgin Mary. So what happened here was from a very young age, it was perfectly normal to ask, to communicate with unseen beings, you know? And so I think that since that was just natural, that they, they were presented to me as my little friends, not like, okay, we're going to worship, you know, just these are, these are, uh, it's part of my, my, um, my environment, you know? So I think that maybe that had something to do with, you know, the asking, but then there's things that, I mean, you would have to be like comatose not to be aware of. Okay, so I'll give you two examples. Two, I, I would say that these two examples uh, had to do with our wedding, okay? So it was unbelievable, okay? So one thing that happened was, and, and you know, people could comment and see which one they think is a stranger. Okay, so one, I dial my friend, Anne, at her studio, and a man answers that's 
not, you know, not her husband. So, and he, and I said, uh, hello. I said, is, is Anne there? And he says, Sophia, is that you? It's Jerry. You called me. You call, listen, I, I'm really late for a meeting. Can I call you this afternoon? And I went, Jerry? I mean, this one guy I know named Jerry that I, I knew only um, casually, socially, actually, socially. And we were, uh, my husband, well, my my uh, fiance at the time, Frank and I were trying to plan a wedding in three months. We decided to get married on uh, 4th of July and our wedding date was 4th of October. So all the venues were taken. So, so I said to him, I mean, I couldn't believe. I said, listen, before you go, can you tell me your telephone number? This is a wrong number. So I was, I was off by one digit, the last digit. Okay. Well, he, I said, promise me, promise me that you're going to call me, Jerry, promise me. So he says, I promise. So he calls me that afternoon. And as a result, uh, he, uh, at the time he owned one of these grand hotels here in Philadelphia, the, the Barclay, which, uh, you know, just this old, beautiful hotel. And as a result, he gave me the ballroom for free. And he threw in the, the presidential suite for two nights. Okay. So that's one. Okay. The other one is I get a call from this woman. And she says, is this Sophia Dimas? And I said, yes. And she says, well, I found your uh, driver's license. And I went, oh, wow. So I, I looked in the pockets. It wasn't there because I don't like to carry bags in the winter. And uh, she says, well, how can I give it to you? And I said, so we determined that she only lived a couple blocks away. So I said, just put it through the mail slot. Okay. Great, thank you very much. She had a nice little note, you know. So um, so then uh, two months later, now we're approaching the wedding. Um, she calls me up, the same woman. She said, um, I, I think you're gonna think this is a little strange, but I found your ATM card. Now, I don't lose cards and and I was used to going to an ATM that, um, you know, would spit it right back at you. But this one held it until after the transaction. And it said, would you like another transaction? So I left thinking that I had the card. So the next person could empty out my, my, uh, my bank account. Well, it was Lisa Marie. She, I mean, it, it was incredible. So, so she said, would you like me to put it through the mail slot? And I said, no, we've got to meet. And so she came to my studio and I had this little bar of uh, this handmade soap to give her as a thank you. And as a result, okay, so she was a concert violinist. As a result, she got her friend who is a uh, uh master at, at the um a classical guitar she she played the violin and he played the guitar at my wedding as i'm walking down the aisle to my favorite concierto concierto de Aranjuez. so i mean i would have to be kind of like brain dead not to see what i need because he, here shaw here's the deal how many people would have told Jerry when he said, I'll call you this afternoon, just say, oh my God, no, I have nothing to, I'm not, I have nothing to talk to you about. This was a wrong number. This is just fantastic coincidence. Wow, bye. And when Lisa Marie said, would you like me to put it through the mail slot? I could have said, yeah, thank you so much. This is so bizarre. But that this is when you, it, when something takes your attention like that, how can you not take action? Mm -hmm. But many people, beautiful, beautiful uh, stories that many people don't see it or they just carry on with life or may, they may say, oh, that was odd. And that's it. Yes. They yes. Carry on and they don't think about it anymore. 
Yes, and and I, I I'm telling you, free will gets in the way. Okay, now there's a thread that runs through the book, and I'm very indebted to my husband for allowing me to write about this. Okay, now. <clears throat> Um, early in our relationship, I discovered that Frank was a rager. He would rage. And it wasn't that I did anything. Like, he would just, you know, mistake something, some gesture as demeaning him. And it, this all stems from childhood issues. And I would have, I mean, I mean, he would go into this rage and then, it, it was just horrible. And the reason, I mean, I had uh, threatened to leave, but I saw that how much he wanted the, re the, the relationship and that he would take action. He, you know, he found this great a therapist. Um, well, he still continued with this, uh, these episodes. Uh, then he actually found a men's group called Menergy that was, you know, a bunch of ragers, you know, from judges to truck drivers. He became the poster boy, but he continued. And finally, I had had enough and I left. And it got to the point where I decided, because my will is really strong. I never want to lay eyes on this jerk ever again. Now, this is my decision. I moved out and the, the uh, being apart, the separation was a total of six months. The last two months, three, I'm not even going to go into, into it, three amazing coincidences happened. The first one had to do with A, a Course in Miracles. The second one had to do with his wedding band. And the third one had to do with a book that led us to a reading in Maui because I was, we were going to Maui so I could be the matron of honor for my best friend for the third time. And I'm reading this book on the plane called End uh, Endless Energy by Deborah Green. And she's talking about these energy clearings and I'm like, wow, you know, oh, this would be fantastic for Frank. He, I mean, he, he, this is amazing. These, these uh, clearings, you know, and, <clears throat> and I'm, you know, going back to the back of the book to look at her citations and, and then I would read and I would tell him about this. And then all of a sudden in the back of the book, I see her name and under her name is Maui, Hawaii. Not only was she in Maui, but she, her address was Kihei Road, and that is where our condo was, okay? Now, I could just go, oh my God, is this wild? Uh, no, no. <clears throat> when we had our um, uh, layover, call her up. You know, we're going to be free these times. And she says, okay, I can do it. I could do this. And I said, just a minute, Frank. I mean, because Frank was not into this stuff at all. I said, um, look, Maui, Kihei Road. What do you say? I said, if you if you agree, it'll be your Christmas present. And he says, well, it's it's meant to be. So we had we had our energy clearing. And that was in 2009. And he has not had one episode since. He's completely transformed. He's a spiritual being. He's my dream companion. Okay, so let's let's talk about free will, you know? Now, I mean, were the were those two miracles that had to do with my my wedding big? Yes. But I, I believe that this string of coincidences that ended up in saving my marriage from divorce is more important to me. So, um, you know, there's, there's no way that I could have not, not paid attention. So 
I don't know. What do you think, Shah? No, I, I agree, but I'm wondering for people out there listening, and it's fascinating how these, we call them coincidences, miracles come into your life. And you were talking about manifestation before. Um, I'm just, you know, I, and everybody's got their own ideas about all that. But what do you, th do you believe that you really just did not want that marriage to end? And you wanted healing for him, for Frank? Uh, not before these three coincidences occurred. Oh. Oh. No, I wanted, I didn't want to see him again ever. Talk to him again ever. So it's because and and the, the coincidence with the wedding band, the the reading was what allowed me, basically forced me to um to agree to to meet with him if he called. Because what I got out of that reading was God is God is in everyone. OK, and if your brother comes to you with his hand outstretched to connect with you and you say no to your brother, you say no to God. I mean, I, I, I can't do that. I can't say no to God. So that allowed me to say, OK, he called the next day. And when he told me the wedding band story. I was completely disarmed. That is when I agreed to see him again. And then, you know, it was, it was, um, the, the love was there. And, and then, um, and then this, I think this, this amazing uh, event that happened in, in Maui, I think solidified everything. So, so, you know, can people change? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, the d divine intelligence co-created right. the healing. Yes. I'd just like to remind you all to click that like button wherever you're listening, wherever you're watching on YouTube. Leave us a comment. It really does help with the algorithm and to push the podcast forward. If you're listening on Apple, Spotify, or any streaming platform, please do the same. Like the video, share it as well, and leave us a five-star review or any review, whatever you're thinking. Feedback is welcome. Thank you for your support. Excellent. So that brings us on, actually, to um, the second book is called Consciousness Beyond Death. True stories of signs, messages, and timing. Again, synchronicity and things like that always come into play. What what I want to say is my mission mission as a spiritual medium is to give evidence of life beyond a physical death. And so I'm what you would call an evidential medium. So I've got to give evidence. And it's not me. It's being channeled, I believe. It's my belief as a medium. That's how I get the messages. I don't know anything. So I'm wondering for you, when you were writing this book, um, what was your inspiration? Because you you have a lot of experience with mediumship. <laughs> well, yeah. See, again, <clears throat> well, first of all, first of all, um, the first book took eight years to write. It was an organizational feat and and I didn't know how to organize it and uh, so Frank kept saying well just keep writing and you can shave off at the end well there were so many miracles events uh, <clears throat> that I instinctually picked plucked out all the ones that had to do with death and so the second book took only a year and a half to write because most of the events were in the first book so uh, is what I gleaned from the, it was already written. So seven of the chapters of the second book are my experiences. And three are of close friends. And and those, I can't pick which one is, is stranger or more hard to believe. <clears throat> but here is something interesting. 
that I am super, super excited about. So um, I knew that scientists um, studied consciousness, okay? I had no idea that they study coincidence. And there's this outfit in the UK called the Scientific and Medical Network. Yes. And it's a, a network of, of you know, well-known scientists. I'm aware that, of it. Oh, really? Yes. So, so um, I, I somehow, and I, I can't really recall how it happened. Somehow I, I uh, got together with the, uh, the executive director and discovered that there's these scientists that study coincidence. And so they invited me to um, help plan and participate in their synchronicity summit that people can look up, and uh, which is unbelievable. I, I was like the only non-scientist academician. So what was even more interesting, okay, was that these, so so there's this interest that sci the scientific community has gotten interested in this book. And so, so some of these scientists that were, um, that have, uh, you know, have in gotten interested in, in the book, wouldn't touch the second book with a 10 foot pole. Okay, so, so then um, the executive director, uh, David Lorimer, uh, sends me two articles on after-death communication. And it was interesting because, I mean, it was a fantastic uh, article that he co-authored. Uh, and the examples that were uh, given were from the Victorian age and turn of the century, because all my experience are, uh, they're contemporary, you know? And so... Um, I had asked one of the scientists to endorse the second book. And he responds and says, I'm sorry, I can't endorse your book because it's not my field. Okay. So now scientists, a slew of them study near-death experiences, right? Because it's an NDE. NDE, near-death experience, they have been scientifically explored for decades, but I can't touch your, th your topic with a 10-foot pole. So three days after I received these two articles, this scientist um, emails me and says, since I received your email, I have received a flurry of after-death communication information, and I will endorse your book. So I think that he received the same articles from, you know, uh, the executive director. So, so guess what? All of a sudden, in this, in this small period of time, just in time for the publication of this book, we have a new field of scientific study that has emerged: ADC, after-death communication. All of a sudden, there's interest. So there you go, and and you know everyone has some kind of um, some kind of story. For example, my uh, eye surgeon. I told my eye surgeon about my book, and she says, "Well, I have a story for you." And I said, "Okay," and she said, "Well, I was supposed to go to a gala with my husband." And I didn't want to go. It was after a, a day full of uh, surgeries. I was dead tired. I did not want to go to this gala, but we had to go to the gala. So, so afterwards, she says, um, "My my, I had to take the babysitter home because it's my husband's rule never to be alone with a female babysitter." And she says, "So I'm coming home. I'm driving home." And all of a sudden, I hear my grandmother scream, wake up. And she said, I woke up and I'm heading into a brick wall. And she, she, was, she could put the brake on. So I'll tell you something. The communications have been so creative. And not all of my stories about, is about after-death communication. There's, they're related to death. Either, um, either somebody who's approaching death there's two stories. One um, 
is a, a story about my mother. And another story is one of my friend's stories, which is absolutely incredible. With it's not it, it's it wasn't my will or my friend's will to do what we did. We were forced in clever, clever ways to fulfill a dying person's last wish. So, I mean, it, it's it's um. And also going back to uh, David Lorimer, uh, his um, one of his uh, uh, articles that he sent me, what he admonishes materialistic scientists um, and says that, you know, you can't dismiss in the in the face of of mounds of anecdotal reports. You, if you do not pay attention to these reports, you are not a true scientist. Yes, I mean, scientists live for the research. That's why they're scientists, aren't they? They're always looking for information and trying to prove something right or wrong or whatever. Yes. But, but see, now we're, we're talking about a, a, a different realm. Yes. And, and basically what this is showing me is that Scientists are catching up to us. Oh, that's so reassuring. Really <laughs> reassuring. <laughs> you know, because um, I often talk about on my shows that there needs to be more research. And I wasn't sure why there wasn't into life after death or mediumship. And I thought it was about funding. Um, and I think it is. I think it is about funding. Um, but but what cha but what why is there funding all of a sudden yes exactly and well uh, perhaps there's more information i think we were talking about this a couple of months ago um the world's opened up with the internet so everywhere you go you only mm -hmm. need to click on something and mm -hmm. everyone's talking about mediumship all the mediums are coming out um everybody's empathy they're talking about empathy now and consciousness and they're all meditating and they're all, um, so I think it's the onslaught of it being so widely available and widely used. I mean, back in the day, as they say, you had to find those books on a bookshelf. If you were lucky, you could find those books in old antique shops sometimes, but now it's a click. Yes, and you know, and, I, and also what I came to the conclusion uh, that, because I couldn't understand why these scientists were embracing me and my stories as a peer, as a peer. And I think that they kind of needed me as much as an, I needed them. So, yeah. so I, I mean, it was wonderful to have, you know, because, um, you know, for, for, to get their validation, you know, but then I was kind of like the little, not a guinea pig, but like a, like I, I validated their research. My stories validate their research. That's a good point. So, so it's, it's, um, uh, and now um, the, we did, we did the synchronicity summit. And so now um, I have submitted, uh, we've, we were invited to submit an essay. They're going to turn it into a book, but uh, but it's uh, it's really they have these wonderful webinars, um, you know, on their website. So so I, I'm I'm just seeing all of this. I'm I'm really excited that these people who act like the scientists who said, "Oh, it's not my field." Well, guess what? It still wasn't his field, but now it was okay. Yeah. It was okay. Interesting, because, you know, there is, you know, in psychotherapy, we talk about the empty chair, we, we use, depending on your training, you know, we use the empty chair, we, we use lots of different concepts, we talk about the unconscious mind, you know, in psychotherapy, and psychiatrists talk about the unconscious, so the, the brain, you, you know, so I, I don't know, or the mind, you can't physically touch it, but you see the, the effects of it. So I, I've always been confused about this divide uh, with science and 
the things that are unseen. Scientists believe that the, it's the brain that concocts consciousness so that when we die, poof, we're gone, okay? But what has been, what has been found, scientifically found, is that there is a um, consciousness is omnipresent. I mean, it's, it's there. Our brains are designed to click in to the consciousness. And you see these physicists, you know, now saying, oh, you know, very, very soon we're going to be able to time travel and bilocate and, and dematerialize and rematerialize. And I'm like, wait a second, you know, yogis have been doing this for thousands of years, okay? And I invite people to, because this is a firsthand story of bilocation, to go on my website, which is my name, sophiademus.com, and I have a page that's my influencers. There is a firsthand story of bilocation, and read the blurb. These are, these are eight people that I consider to be my mentors. Uh, Abbas Ameliani, who runs a uh, monastery, a Greek, uh, uh, Greek Orthodox monastery in Maryland, in the state of Maryland. A ma absolutely magnificent woman, and her story, I mean, can, will blow everyone away. So, I mean, because these things do happen, they've been happening. Yogananda, uh, Paramahasa Yogananda has, I mean, his uh, autobiography of a yogi, I mean, he, he just, he, it's actually like kind of when I was reading it, it was very much like my book, you know, talking about, you know, his experiences. And that was a strange experience. Reading that book, I thought it almost felt like I had a, a conversation with him. Like I would think of something or a question and then like two paragraphs down, he would answer me. That was, that was just amazing uh, experience. But these things are not new. Yes. And, and we, we know this. It's interesting. We, we've always said that, you know, in back way back when we've always said, but in my early training, especially in psychiatry, the psychiatrist would be so afraid when somebody mentioned maybe rebirthing or meditation or trying something like something to expand their consciousness. And if they set, use that phrase, it would be, Oh no, uh, they're going to relapse or it's going to set them back or they could go into psychosis. You know, it was all this, there's all this fear. And when psychiatrists or when scientists talk about uh, the concept of the unconscious or uh, mediumship, you know, being able to hear things or even hearing things that are inaudible to the human ear. Yes. For me, that's where the line that's where my argument always is with science. It's and a great argument. It's a great argument because I have, um, I write about these experiences hearing. Um, and one that, um, one experience that brought my husband and I to this place in uh, upstate New York which is called Lilydale. I don't know. Do you have you heard of Lilydale? Okay, this uh, this it's a spiritual community um, that started in 1848, and it was the first seance happened oh. at Lilydale, and all these mediums go there, and people from all over um, go to uh, to get messages, you know, from their loved ones, and I had. It's incredible. This one story, and it's in the second book, and it's called Lily Dale, that brought us to this place. Again, I had no interest in going to a medium, none, none. And, and the first time, too, it was it was an accident. Okay. So um, so we we went there and somehow this person told us that that there was a, a meditation cer ceremony uh, um yeah what do they call it uh, message ceremonies there were message ceremonies they said oh it's sunday today oh they, they, there's two message ceremonies so i thought oh well we have to go 
And it was a lot of people, you know, so we sat back so I could see the show because I wanted to see the reactions. So these mediums would, you know, one by one, each one would do two readings and would say, um, you with the purple sweater, you know, would will you receive? And so I, I'm just like, I would say 95% of whatever the message, the person resonated, you know, like, oh, wow, that's my uncle Roy, you know? And so, um, and so I'm just like, oh, wow, this is so incredible. And then towards the end, this medium points at towards me and says, you with the white hair and glasses. And I look around, because like a quarter of the people, half the people there had white hair and glasses. And, um, and so I was looking, she said, no, you with the red, the, the uh, green headband. And I'm like me, you know, and I, she gave me two messages. Unbelievable. She gave me a message from my father, which was exactly what I wanted to hear from him. I mean, and, and not only that, but she had him pinned physically. Because at first she said, okay, it's your father. He's short and stocky. And then she changed it. And she said, no, he's short and solid. And that was him, just sinewy, muscly, you know. And, uh, and then she gave me a message for my nephew who was going through a dark period. And she said, what he wants to tell him is don't do, don't do something on earth that you will be, that will take you to the other side and be sorry for what you did. And I called him because I knew he was going through a dark period. And I told him, you know, and I did exactly what the mediums did. Will you receive? You know, and then um, I said, this is what, this is the message for you. Does this make sense to you? And he goes, oh yeah. And he tells me that it, it was much worse than I had thought, that his wife had taken the three kids to and moved, went back to her parents' house and he was there with the gun. How does that work? How did these two messages? I mean, this is this whole thing with the science is it's shop. It's validating your work. Yeah, it's great. It's good. Yes, and I'm I'm I. It's powerful and it's you know inspiring. And I hope it long may it continue. And we need more. And the UK is very. I I think. Um, here we we do have a lot of and i'm sure the states does as well and canada and you know in europe you mentioned greece greece very spiritual the energy there although it has changed a lot recently but you know because of some, some turmoil there but it's a lovely people are open people are more open including the scientists and what always makes me laugh is a lot of my clients and people who come for mediumship i have three who are psychiatrists i you know so i've always had therapists who come as well um but a lot of the um uh, well i won't say but lots of different people in different professions that are seen as scientific do come for reading yeah. Um, but I don't know how open they are in telling people that they come for readings. And that's yes. fine. I'm not, my job, I just do my work, the work I do. You know, you, you asked a question earlier. You know, you said, well, um, do you see a change of kind of like be becoming more helpful? You know, it's interesting because each profession uh, brought me to another level of helping others, you know. So we went from architecture, uh, and then that took me way uh, from way uh, away from um, beauty, you know. And and because I was designing biotechnology laboratories, so um, I started my dress designing business. Yes. And and it was through that 
that I noticed that there was these beautiful rich women who were just had no confidence. And then I had these large queen size women that were just absolutely secure in themselves. So I thought, what's wrong with this picture? You know, self-esteem. That's when I went back to school and got my master's in counseling psychology when I was 50. And then that brought me to design, uh, create a 12 workshop program initially uh, designed to enhance self-esteem in incarcerated women because I had a captive audience, but then did it for uh, women at risk. So now I just, I just got a job where um, it, uh, it, I'm gonna, my employer is the um, uh, Salvation Army that started in the UK and they have a residence uh, to help ex-trafficked women um, that want out, they want a, a different life and they can live at this residence for up to two years, um, save their money and get an apartment. And it's, it's a, a part-time job and I'm the in-house counselor. And so, and so there's so much trauma here. And so it's gotten from designing, you know, at the beginning, designing the beautiful building to helping women find their way. You know, it's a, it's a process, an evolution. A pro yes, but you see, I would say that even in your architecture um, incarnation as such, you were designing spaces that were, I would say, equipped and the energy was right so that people could create in them. Mm -hmm. And that takes a skill. That is a skill. It's a skill set. So I would say that was creativity as well. And you were preparing that for people to go in and do the, the work mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. such. But you've had very interesting choices for because of free will. I believe we do make cho those choices for you in your career. Um, and how are you feeling now about continuing the counseling in a way that is so incredibly inspiring? especially for these underprivileged women who need the support is to guide them to um uh you know there's there's so many modalities you know um and uh, one of my favorite things that 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 actually um was the inspiration to even design this workshop program i called it the living a fearless life was um the book by Don Miguel Ruiz called The Four Agreements. That book, um, I utilize that book because I believe without a doubt that if everybody practiced The Four Agreements, because if you, if you just tell it to somebody, they can go, yeah, well, yeah, okay. But it's the way it's presented in a circuitous manner. If everybody practiced The Four Agreements every therapist would be out of work. That's how I feel about it. But, you know, it's, um, and it, it's, it's really caring about these women. I mean, really caring. I mean, I can't tell you how satisfying it is that, you know, when I had, you know, when I had been doing it in the past, uh, like once in a while, like one will see me on the street and run over and tell me like, oh, you know, you said this one thing, or, you know, that book that you, you know, and these are seeds so that it's, it's really one of the most fulfilling things is to see what's happened. One of the women, one of the women, she was, um, it was a, a alternative to incarceration. She's an Asian woman. I have never seen an Asian woman in, uh, you know, in, in, in the penal system. And she, it ended up that she gave the commencement speech at my uh, daughter's graduation from college. So, you know, it, it's just so fulfilling. It's incredible. Oh, my goodness. But, Sophia, you are doing some incredible work. So, I mean, and it just continues and it lives on now through your books 
Um, and I know, I, well, I feel there's more to come. And so that certainly it will live on, you know, for generations and generations. And I think what you're doing is you're teaching, the way you're a teacher, you're teaching people. This is, if you want, if you want to open up to receive, this can happen to you. This can be yeah. in your life. Yes. Yes, because um, what regardless if you believe or not and you know what's really interesting this is really interesting so the first book you know when I did my my book proposal there's a marketing uh uh part to it and so you um uh you tar you you say what is your target market and what is not your target market so what was not my target market was I picked the evangelicals and the atheists Okay, so I don't know any evangelicals, really, but I know a slew of atheists. So I gave the advanced reader copy to 10 atheists that I know. Okay, and then they all, everybody filled a questionnaire. So I was, I was ready for the uh, rolling of the eyes, you know. I was shocked. All 10 atheists loved the book. All 10 said that they would give it to another atheist. All 10 in, in different ways, let me know that these were not miracles, okay? These are not miracles. These events are the uh, manifestation of my all powerful mind. And then I, I cleverly seized on this opportunity and I created this external miracle, and I have no business crediting God. How about that one? I think that's stranger, that my mind would create an external thing. Okay, I could see thoughts, but an external thing, that's what got me to study quantum mechanics. Right. Because I don't realize what they were saying, but yeah. I I'm sorry? I don't think they realized that the atheists, what they were actually saying. Yes, yes. And because, I mean, when I first started the book, I thought, oh, my faith is unshakable. But I wanted to know, how do these things happen here on Earth? And it, it helped. Quantum mechanics helped me, you know. But this is what they came up with. So I, I just, so it, it's, the, it's the, the mind saying, yes, this can happen. This can happen. But there's no, there's no divine intelligence because once we take the action, we become co-creators with this divine intelligence. We become, and then it happens. Yes, uh, yeah. Interesting though how they were insistent, and as we talked about earlier in the interview, some people. You know, I suppose they're just not there, and that's fine. They're not um, open to it. We all have our belief systems, so yes. and we co we coexist, and as long as we're not harming anyone, I suppose it's fine. But very interesting the feedback you got about that. Yes, yes, and so so again, the neither book is designed to change minds. It's just that. Well, you know, this happened to me for sure, you know, so it, it, it uh, but it has changed some minds. I mean, it's some of these reviews are real interesting to read about how people have changed in both um, the material in both books, you know, so, uh, so the thing is, it's like, you know, here's the buffet, okay, you know, help yourself. Absolutely. And I know that viewers will get that from you today, from this interview, that look, you know, here it is, here it all is, you know, and go and get both books because they are different. And you do touch upon two very different um, issues there. So the and both do, okay, there's a theme, but I think with the consciousness, when you're looking at consciousness beyond death, you're really delving into then you're getting into near death too and it's not just about the physical body leaving this earth plane it's bigger than that and then when you talk about to the divine language 
of coincidence or synchronicity, we're really talking about something very different there. We're talking about these incidents, um, views, visions, whatever they are. Because communications. Communications, they come in many different forms. And so what you do is you delve into that. These are the ways, some of the ways in which they can come into your life. So maybe just be open a bit to seeing them, hearing them, feeling them, with however they however they communicated to you. Would that be yeah. an accurate um an accurate summary? Oh, l listen, yes, and I I really would like to thank you for offering your platform uh and and, and putting these things out to to people of of uh from different fields, from you know, different viewpoints. I, I think it's a, a wonderful thing you're doing. Thank you, Sophia. And it's been amazing speaking to you. Thank you so much. It was so nice to meet you. Thank you for joining me today. Be sure to like, subscribe, and comment, and share the video on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow on your favorite social media platform. See you soon.